Hello everyone, my name is Mike and I'm sharing with you my top 10 ideas for improving your group delay measurements on frequency converting devices that have embedded local oscillators. For example, I mean a device like this, MyTech Satellite Block Down Converter. This thing takes a 20 gigahertz signal in and down converts it to about 1 gigahertz using an internal local oscillator that's operating at 18.75 gigahertz. So it's a device with an embedded LO and I want to measure the group delay of this device. And in fact, I have 10 ways to make that group delay as fast and accurate as possible. And that's what I'm sharing with you. Now, of course, for making these measurements, I'm going to use the Roden Shorts ZNA Vector Network Analyzer. We introduced this network analyzer about one year ago, and we optimized it for making frequency converting measurements, such as this group delay measurement that I'm going to show today. So, in addition to that, I'm going to use option K9, which is our two-tone technique for making the group delay measurement. And this option you can read more about by looking at application note 1EZ81, which goes into all the detail of how this two-tone technique works for measuring group delay on devices with embedded LOs. Now, as I said, I have 10 techniques for improving your measurement accuracy, and each technique has its own video. And we are now up to idea number 10. So video number 10, this is the culmination of all the ideas up to now, and I'm gonna share with you the last thing we have for making improvements to your measurement accuracy. And this is something I've been waiting for for a long time. This is the ability to add S-parameter error correction to our two-tone group delay technique. So not only now are we able to measure group delay on devices with embedded LOs, but we also get vector corrected return loss to handle the mismatch that occurs between the device under test and the network analyzer. So we now have real error models applied to the measurement channel in addition to everything else we've done in the previous nine videos. This is what's going to make our measurement finally the most accurate it can possibly be. And so I can't wait to show you how it actually looks on the instrument. It's really, really exciting. So let's go to the instrument. We'll start from a preset condition. And again, I wanna launch my GPID Explorer tool under the application key. And I want to set up the channels using a script. And I've called this number 10 enhanced wave correction. So I wanna create two channels which I can use to demonstrate the, the S parameter error correction being applied on one channel and not on the other. So it's asking me to connect the calibration mixer, which I've already done. And we're done, we've complete. So I now have two channels that are identical. At this point, neither channel has S parameter correction applied to it, but I'm reserving the fact that I wanna put S parameter correction on this channel here, the second channel. So first thing I wanna do is tie together the scales, scale coupling, so these guys track, and I wanna zoom in a bit on them because, oops, this way. Uh, where do we go here? Okay, because both channels right now are doing the same thing, so they both are have about the same performance. And if I look at the peak-to-peak -peak variation, I see about 30 picoseconds in both channels. Now, what I wanna do is apply the S-parameter error correction on the second channel so that I can take advantage of that. So in order to do that, let me show you what it looks like, what the process looks like to do the calibration. So before we can calibrate a channel for two-tone group delay with S-parameter correction, we have to at least tell the instrument what the channel looks like. So normally what you would do is go to measure, you would select two-tone group delay, and you would set up the measurement like this. Okay, this is what I did in all the previous videos where we optimized all the different settings. So you fill in the dialog box, and at that point you are ready to calibrate the channel for S-parameter correction. So we say okay. Oh, that was channel one, so I actually want to do this for channel two. And we say okay, and both channels are identical at this point. And then we can go to the calibration key, and we can say let's configure this channel for calibration. Now I'm getting a dialog box that says, in fact, I already applied a channel, a calibration to this channel um, in my script file, and it's going to overwrite that channel when I do a new calibration. I'm okay with that, so we'll just say go ahead and overwrite the file. Now it opens up a dialog box that's a bit busy, but we don't have to worry about any of the details in this dialog box right now because there is a button in the bottom left corner that says auto set the dialog box for the calibration that we need in this channel. So we'll just accept all of those settings for now and move forward with the calibration. Now it says please connect the auto cal to the two ports. This is the first time we're doing this 
in the 10 videos. So this is the first time we're going to have S-parameter error correction during our measurement. So this is, like I say, I've been saving this to the very end because it is the best thing. And I'm really excited to have this option in our network analyzer. So I'm connecting the AutoCal to the two ports. Then I can press the detect ports and start cal button. Now, a couple things I want to point out. First of all, I almost always press this detect ports and start cal button instead of just start cal. The reason is, if I mix up how I've connected the cables to the auto cal, this detect ports button will go out and find out what I did, and then it will automatically adapt to what I did. So if I ever swap the cables by accident, that button will save my, say, well, it will hide my mistake and it will just correct for it automatically. So. I almost always press that button because there's almost no drawback to doing it. The only time I don't press it is if I somehow forget and I aim at the other button by accident. Now, the other thing I want to point out, I'm still using 6 dB attenuators on my port 2 cable to settle down the mismatch that occurs between my device under test and the VNA. So even though I'm going to be applying an error model, I still want to take advantage of the attenuator for the mismatch correction. So to me, this error model doesn't mean stop using attenuators, it means Let's reassess how good we can make our measurement and let's go even further. That's what it really means. So let's apply this calibration. And then in the second step, I have to redo the mixer delay calibration. Now that I have an error model being used on the channel, it's gonna change my mixer delay calibration. So that will always be step two when I'm creating a calibrated group delay channel. So I'm now connecting the calibration mixer to the VNA, and then we'll see the traces settle down. There you go. And then I'm going to recalibrate channel two so that I can take advantage of this latest error model that's been loaded. So to do that, the, the, the delay calibration, we go to the channel, we select measure, two-tone group delay, and then we just say mixer delay cap. So after I do that, now trace two or channel two becomes a nice flat trace, just like trace one. But the difference is, is that channel two has a calibration, this cal, which means the S parameter correction is applied. And it also has an M cal. The M cal means the group delay correction is applied. This channel only has the group delay correction, which is a basically the normalization. So the drawback of this channel is that any mismatch change that occurs from when I calibrate to when I measure will show up in the trace whereas this channel will correct for the mismatch and minimize the effect even though we aren't necessarily going to use attenuators. So in this case, I am using attenuators and I still want to see the effect. So the next step is to add a small piece of transmission line to the output of the calibration mixer. Again, as a reminder, this is what we did in video number nine. This is going to cause the output return loss to rotate on the Smith chart to a different location. It'll still be a good return loss, but it'll have a different reflection angle. And in the normalized trace on this channel, it's going to cause ripple in the results that and the second channel with the error correction model is going to be lower ripple. So let's see it. Let's see what it looks like. You have to keep in mind when at the end of video number nine on that normalized channel, which is duplicated here on the top screen, we were very happy with the results we saw, only a few hundred picoseconds of variation because we had attenuators in place to settle down the mismatch. But now take a look. The top channel still has a peak-to-peak -peak variation of 200 picoseconds. We were really happy with that just one video back. But the bottom channel now with the vector correction being applied has peak-to-peak -peak variation of only 50 picoseconds. We are another factor four better than we were just one video back. So we now have all of the ideas that I had in my playbook applied on this channel, and we've gotten this peak-to-peak -peak variation down to a very small number, even after we change the mismatch on the calibration mixer. So we have, we are adapting to the new mismatch and we're still making a very good measurement. So, so this is, this is number 10 on my list. This is the absolute best idea, the best option we have. This is one I've been waiting for for so long and I'm really glad to have it and I can't wait to show it to you. Uh, I hope you can take advantage of this option very soon. It's going to make your group delay measurements even more accurate than they have been up to now. And they've been very good on the Roden Schwartz ZNA. So 
that's the conclusion of my number 10 video. And I can see already, I need to do a summary here because we've already done a lot of things in videos one through 10. We've made a lot of improvements. So I'm gonna make one more video where I summarize everything we did and I show a before and after comparison on the device under test where I showed what we had in video number one compared to what we have now at the end of video number 10. That is gonna be a dramatic improvement. So for sure you wanna see that. Um, and I'm going to summarize all the different things we did. So that's coming up in the next video. Stay tuned.